Every cottager knows there's a precise art to roasting the perfect marshmallow. To get one that's golden on the outside and liquid on the inside, without it bursting into a charred ball of flames, you need to turn it slowly over a fire that's died down to glowing embers. Which means you need a lot of patience. But if you have kids around the campfire, patience isn't always an option, especially when pesky mosquitoes are distracting you from the task at hand. That's why new, off, family care, smooth and dry mosquito repellent is a campfire essential. It repels mosquitoes for up to five hours, and it goes on as smooth powder instead of an oily, greasy film. Try it at your next campfire, and you'll be ready to master the patient art of marshmallow roasting. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly, Editor-in-Chief of Cottage Life magazine. In this episode, we answer all of your questions about an often overlooked aspect of the cottage experience, the drive. We'll also listen to the extraordinary sound that ruffed grouse make, and we revisit an essay about cottage commuting. Bullet drivers versus happy meanderers, which one are you? This is the Cottage Life podcast, where every day is the weekend. Whether your drive to the lake takes a short, enviable hour or as many as five, once you count all those stopovers, the cottage commute is a part of the weekend experience that can't be avoided. All cottagers have spent time in traffic, of course, but how many know how traffic actually works? And more importantly, how do cottagers contribute to traffic buildup, often without even meaning to? We wanted to get to the bottom of these questions in the hopes that it might make the tiniest bit of difference to your next long drive to the lake. Dr. Eric Miller is a professor and researcher at the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute. His study focuses on how traffic works. He's joined us to unravel some of these motoring mysteries. Could you tell us about the work that you do uh, at U of T? Most of my research has to do with trying to, first of all, understand and then model travel behavior, usually within a large urban area like Toronto. So we will do surveys where we ask people, what did you do yesterday? Tell us about all your trips you've made. And then using that data, we build mathematical computer-based simulation models that allow us to test how people will react to different policies. If we build a subway, will people use it? These sorts of things. So, so the, the models actually, I like to say, we wake them up in the morning and we ask, him, ask people, what are you going to do today? And based on probabilities, we, we say somebody's going to go to work, uh, they're going to leave at 8 a.m. in the morning, they're going to drive. Um, and then based once we've done that for everybody, we can model the flows on the road and transit systems to estimate congestion, crowding on the subways and these sorts of things. So you kind of know everyone and when they're coming and when they're going. It's like a, you're like the master puppeteer in the city, it sounds like. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of like Santa Claus. <laughs> I, I, know, I, 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 know, I know when you're going. Well, I think I know. Obviously, we're working in a virtual world of simulation. We're simulating, you know, avatars that are we hope are behaving similar to real people. So it's so fascinating. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I think that people get in their cars and they it is so much a matter of routine when we drive places to work, to the cottage, wherever we're going. We get in the car and, and you know, you hear people say, you're just on autopilot, you got your coffee, you put on your music and off you go. Um, but I think that's ingrained in some of those habits uh, that we have and those routines are some bad habits. And I, I, I wondered if you could share um, any insight into the things that we habitually do as drivers that are actually slowing down the flow of traffic? First of all, the uh, classical slow driver in the left-hand lane, which drives everybody crazy, uh, it clearly, is clearly slowing down traffic in that lane in particular, but, uh, but it, it, it's also creating um, excessive weaving maneuvers as people are trying to maneuver around them. And those weaving maneuvers, whether it's caused by a slow driver or just somebody who wants to go super fast, those weaving maneuvers themselves can actually slow down traffic because, you know, somebody cuts in front of you, you have to brake a little bit, the guy behind you brakes a little bit, and maybe the person behind, you know, it usually these things uh, die out, but but all that, that extra turmoil and turbulence that's created in, in the traffic 
by people dodging in and out and, and making other people slow down. Uh, these sorts of things actually slows down traffic as a whole. Traffic moves best when it's nice and smooth and, uh, you know, and, and moving at a constant speed. Every time we disrupt it, it, it slows things down. So can I ask you a question about that? So if I'm in the left-hand lane and um, there's a slow car in front of me and I want to get around it, is it better to just sit there and wait uh, until they move? Or does it actually slow down the traffic for me to go around them on to pass on the right? Well, I, I think it depends on how you make that maneuver. If you're careful, you're watching your mirrors, there is a gap in the traffic to your right. So you can slide over without disturbing the car that's now behind you. Uh, and then you pass and then you, yeah, again, you, you have a gap to move back what's in the left-hand lane. So if you could be moving that, uh, making that maneuver in a way that you're not disturbing the cars behind you and making them slow down, then yes, that's fine. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, that, that's, that's a good thing to do. So, I mean, I think a lot of it is, is, a, Everybody, if everybody drove safely and drove the way you were taught in driver ed, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, everybody would move much more smoothly and safely. And because the other thing is, of course, the more weaving, the more you know, jumping in front of somebody, uh, jumping from lane to lane, the more likely there is going to be an accident, and that of course really slows things down. Yeah, of course, that's the very worst thing. And, and I also find too, if I'm, you know, just driving along, I, I tend to drive in the right hand lane. I'm, I'm going to admit it. I, I'm not a fast driver. I'm a steady driver. And I find um, that if I see someone making a really dangerous, sudden move ahead of me, I actually instinctively tap my brakes. And that is also a problem, right? Because then the guy exactly. behind me and then the woman behind him and then the whole highway is tapping on their brakes. And that's what causes that phantom slowdown, if I yeah, understand ex correctly. Yeah, ex exactly. In our technical work, we actually we call them shock waves. And it is actually, you create a shock wave. There's this wave of red lights coming backwards up, up stream and and yes and it's dangerous and it slows every everything down and it's a natural reaction yeah you're you're, you're going to break because and and uh, and so and you know and the person weaving in and 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 speeding along doesn't see it because it's happening behind him right uh so he doesn't know the turmoil he's causing right interesting so here's another thing that i think does also slow down the traffic and that's distracted driving um, you know, whether it's looking at your phone, drinking, reaching for your coffee, um, mucking around with the radio, whatever you're doing, you know that you're not paying 100% attention to the road. And if that happens, obviously there's more margin for error and that can cause an accident. But even, you know, say you're lucky enough uh, to not have that accident. Does this kind of distracted driving also cause traffic slowdowns inadvertently? Well, yes, and, and for, it's it's much the same phenomena because let's let's say you are distracted, so maybe you slow down a little bit. Maybe you don't even put on your brakes, but you slow down because yeah, you're reaching for that cup of coffee or, or whatever, and and then the person behind you has to slow down. Also distracted, maybe you're weaving a little bit. You may not go completely out of the lane, but but you know people around you see you. You know you're edging one way or the other because you're not paying enough attention. That's going to cause people to slow down, uh, possibly brake. Uh, they may they may move in their lane a little bit. So, so yeah, again, anytime anybody's doing anything that's affecting the cars around them and the driver's behavior, uh, this is, this could, could well slow down traffic. And again, is, is unsafe. It's not just unsafe because of the driver's distracted. You're making other people around you perhaps do some things that are a little unsafe or you're startling them and, and maybe they make a mistake in, in, in their reaction. Okay. So speaking of distracted, distracted driving, I actually heard a rumor this week and I think you're the perfect person to to confirm it or not. Um, I noticed the other day when I was driving home from the cottage that there are signs on the side of the highway now that say, you know, that the, the warn against distracted driving. So you're kind of taking your attention away from the road to look at a sign that tells you not to get distracted. <laughs> I, I have heard from someone this week that there's actually been studies done that show that, in fact, now they're now learning that those kinds of signs are, in fact, problematic. And there's traffic slowdowns and accidents in, the prox in close proximity to those signs almost consistently. Is that true? I believe it is. I've not done the research directly, but I have a colleague. He's actually in economics at U of T, but these are the sorts of things he's interested in. Uh, and uh, and yes, uh, there he, he's actually written a paper on this, uh, trying to get better data on it. But it does appear that it, it, it does distract people and and, uh, and and it slows them down or, or leads to, you know, more erratic behavior. 
yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's a real challenge. You want to get information to people. You want to encourage them to do things, but it is actually very easy to be distracted uh, while you're driving. And it doesn't take much to, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it's actually kind of logical that that is the truth, but it's also kind of counterintuitive because the truth is we do need reminders all the time now. I see exactly what you mean about it being tricky. Um, here's another thing that I think is a bit counterintuitive. I, I've always been the person who goes, I mean, maybe I go a little bit over the speed limit, but certainly not by much. And I've always thought going much faster actually doesn't get you there much, much faster. <laughs> you know, you, you could go 108 on the 401 or you could go 120, but it might make the difference of 10 minutes at the end of the, of the day, which is approximately the length of one bathroom break. So here's a question for you. It, it, is that true? Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it really, you know, you're better off to go slow to go fast? Uh, yeah, for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, yeah. I mean, as you, as you put it, you know, going well over the speed limit, if you can consistently do that, you may get there a few minutes earlier. But really, uh, you know, what does five minutes or even 10 minutes mean in the scheme of things? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, but to do that, the more likely you are to get involved in an accident because your reaction time doesn't get faster if you drive faster. You know, it takes us at least a second to respond to, you know, brake lights or that deer running across the road or whatever it is. And the faster you're going, the more likely it is you're not going to hit the brakes. <laughs> and you're going to end up hitting the deer. Um, so, so you're risking your own life. You're risking people around you, uh, and you're not getting there that much faster. Plus, if you are in any sort of traffic, yeah, you're just rushing to get, you know, to get caught up with the next uh, block of cars that are going to slow you down. Uh, and and so you're really not going to. You're not accomplishing much. You feel like you are. I mean, you know, it, this it's it's all psychological, right? You, if you're passing passing a few cars and you're moving ahead, and that that that. that satisfies an itch, you know, but it's really not accomplishing much com- compared to the risks and, and the impact you're having on people around you. Ah, I've always thought that. I'm glad to have you confirm it. Okay, here's another thing I've always wondered about. I think this is actually quite controversial. I think a lot of people really hate it when you're, uh, the most common example, I think, is when you're trying to get off a highway um, and you're all lined up, maybe there's a lot of traffic, and you're all lined up at the ramp, at the uh, off-ramp, and another car comes speeding up on the left-hand side and butts into the line way, way ahead of you. And, um, you know, that is, as a driver, it feels like there's few things more offensive than being butted in line. <laughs> uh, but then I've always kind of wondered, Aren't you supposed to, like, isn't a merge, like a merge isn't something that's supposed to happen way, way back from the point of merging, is it? Or is it actually better for some people to come up the side and to go in at the top and just to let them in and and continue this traffic flow that you suggested earlier was the best way of driving? So what is it? Do you late merge or do you early merge? And what is, what is the right way to do that? Well, um, it depends a little bit on how early, I mean, (laughs) and and how late, I mean, but the, the, the ideal would be a fairly cooperative uh, thing in which people are gradually merging. You know, some merge a bit early, some merge a little bit later, but uh, but that people are not charging up right to wherever you you, you know the, the lane ends and you have to get on the ramp or whatever the case may be, um, because by butting in. It's it's actually similar to what we were talking about before. When you butt in, when you force your way in. You are slowing down everybody behind you, um, and so you. Uh, the, the problem is, from your point of view as a selfish driver, it can actually be the rational thing to do. In that you you're you're you are bypassing that queue. You are saving yourself some waiting time, and you butt in, and you can usually you know unfortunately successfully do that. Um, so you do reduce your own time. Again, how much you know a minute, two minutes, uh, you know. Five minutes, maybe if it's a bad jam, mm-hmm. uh, but you are imposing greater delay on everybody else. Right, uh, and again, there's always a possibility of an accident. So, it, it the ideal situation would be as you know, so people, let's say people are on the right hand lane, if that's the case for the ramp, and people are coming up on the left. If the people on the in the right hand lane, you know, if every car let in one car, 
uh, you know, make space for one car. Uh, again, you would have a much smoother. Everybody would keep rolling slowly, but 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 you wouldn't have this stop start, which which delays everybody. And on average, everybody would be better off uh, if 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 you were letting people kind of, kind of in one car at a time. But that's hard to do because you know some people are more generous with this than others. Some people some people are more rammy. Um, but uh, you know, and I think a, a general problem we have with traffic in general is by and large not that people are bad people but everybody drives and does things to kind of maximize their own benefit to reduce their own travel time and they don't see the extra time the extra delay the extra danger perhaps whatever the case may be that they're imposing on everybody else by their actions um, right. And, 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 and so it's very hard to get everybody to kind of cooperate out there. I mean, this will be, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk about autonomous vehicles and maybe someday, you know, we won't be driving them. The cars will be driving themselves. This is the sort of thing the AV the autonomous vehicles might actually do very well. They'll be much more cooperative. They'll talk to each other. You know, they'll say, hey, can you make just a little more space for me? I need to get over, you know, I, they'll be much more rational. Not so e- not so egocentric, perhaps. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You take yeah. the ego out of driving, it's a whole other ball game. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, tell me, are there any things, surprising things about traffic that people don't know? I'm kind of curious if you're like at a cocktail party and you tell people what you do for a living and study traffic, if there's something that always sort of makes them go, really? I never knew that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, when they sort of tell somebody at a cocktail party, I mean, I, it always reminds me of one of the Mission Impossible uh, movies. Uh, Tom Cruise, his cover story is that he's a, he's a traffic engineer working for the U.S. Department of Transportation. And he uses that because he assumes that puts everybody to sleep immediately, that nobody wants to know what he does. He's so <laughs> wrong. I could not disagree more. I find, I mean, for cottagers especially, we're in our yeah, car so yeah. much. I think I find it fascinating. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, one thing I guess is maybe the, you know, the phantom um, roadblock. I mean, you're stuck in a traffic jam, you know, you, you, you're you're creeping, crawling, stop starting, and you have no idea why. And then eventually it clear, you know, eventually all of a sudden traffic starts to move again. And you, so you assume there's an accident or you assume there's something, but you never see it, right? And I think that people find that frustrating and they wonder, well, you know, well, well what is that all about? I mean, the pro- that usually results because maybe there was an accident or a car blocking a lane or something, um, and it gets cleared away. But the queue that forms behind it, the traffic jam that forms behind it, can take a long time, if you have a lot of traffic, it can take a long time to clear well past when whatever the blockage was has been removed. So this is why we see so these phantom, it seem like phantom traffic jams. It, right. It just takes so long to, to clear. Um, that kind of reminds me of another thing that causes slows down traffic is rubbernecking obviously, uh, that we haven't yes. talked about, you know, the, there's an accident on the other side and everybody has to slow down to have a look at it, you know? So, uh, anyway, um, what else surprises people? Oh, well, I think the other surprising thing, which I don't think it, it certainly never occurred to people and it's not something you even see is that one of the reasons traffic jams are just so devastating is not only do you slow down, I mean, you get stuck in a traffic jam, you, you obviously slow down. You're creeping along, so your speed has gone way down. But what you don't see is, in fact, the number of cars that are flowing past a point, the capacity of that point, you, you know, how many cars can you actually move past a point per hour or per minute, actually goes down. But under normal operating conditions, there's so many cars we can put through a lane. An ideal lane of highway, like the 400 or the 401, you can put about under ideal conditions, you can get about 2,400 cars an hour passing a point. That's the capacity of it. But what happens when a traffic jam happens, the, 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 the physics of how cars are moving actually breaks down and you lose capacity. Not only are you going slower, but you're maybe only putting 1,800 cars an hour through that bottleneck. So this this kind of doubles up the effect. Not only is everybody moving slower, but it's going to take longer to get how many, however many cars you have through this point, because the actual ability to process those cars through that point actually falls. 
Um, and so that's that's something that you know you don't see, but mathematically we can show it happen, and empirically, I mean, if you actually go and measure it, um, lots of data from highways all over the world, this actually happens. So we talk about this capacity drop, um, and so the holy grail for traffic engineers is to control traffic so that you never reach that catastrophic point where the capacity drops. People, people may be moving somewhat slowly, but they're, they're moving at, at the higher capacity, so you're actually moving more cars. And, and that's, 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 that's the objective of much of traffic engineering is, 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 is to try to avoid that, that capacity loss at a point. Easier said than done. I mean, what a challenge because you you can look at all the data you want, but there's one variable there that you can never predict, and that's human behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would find that to be frustrating when, uh, you know, one, one guy, it's the same with all traffic, I guess, and maybe this is the note to stop on. One guy making one mistake can have reverberations for, for a long time for a lot of people. So it's really important to be thinking about karma when you're driving because you might be the guy making the mistake to get ahead this time, but that means next time you're going to be the guy way at the back of the pack yeah. who is suffering from the consequences of someone else's mistake. Yeah, I think that's very well put. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. That's great. Well, everyone, that's that is what I'll leave you on because that should be the thing that all cottagers think about as they may well be driving right at this moment listening to this podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric, for all of this. I, I, I find this absolutely fascinating. I don't agree with Tom Cruise at all. This is an <laughs> amazing field of study. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come and chat with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. It's, it's been fun. Leanne Vobechko is here to decode the sounds we hear when we're at the cottage. She's a longtime Cottage Life editor and our resident nature enthusiast. Welcome back to the podcast, Leanne. Hi, Michelle. Today's sound is something I often hear at the cottage when I'm out running along this one stretch of road. Here it is. Whoa, what is that? I can almost always tell what the species are when you bring them on the podcast, but that one I really have no idea. It sounds kind of like a motorcycle engine starting. Is that even a sound from nature? It sure is. That is a bird sound. What kind of bird makes that sound? That is the sound of a ruffed grouse. It's a medium-sized game bird about the size of a crow. It's a ground bird, but it will fly for short distances. It's really well camouflaged and it has a crest on its head. The Cornell Labs All About Birds describes it as being dappled, grayish, brownish, or reddish. So you really have to be able to hear this bird because it sounds like it would be tough to see. Yeah, it's really, it's really hard to spot. So the most interesting thing is that this sound isn't a vocalization. That is, it's not made by their voice. It's the movement of their wings as they rotate them back and forth quickly. So they're making that crazy sound with their wings? That's right. You can hear that the thumping sound starts slowly and then gets faster and faster until it's just a blur. There may be up to 50 beats making the sound, which typically lasts about 8 to 10 seconds. Interesting. I would not expect that wings could get so loud. Yes, but it's how their wings make the sound that's so interesting. It was unknown for a long time. Naturalists about 250 years ago believed that it was the wings striking their sides or their breast or the wings clapping together that was creating the sound. Okay. But it wasn't until the 1920s when researchers finally figured out how it really happens. Oh, so that was a seriously enduring mystery, wasn't it? Yes. Arthur Augustus Allen was the founder of the now world-renowned ornithology lab at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And by all accounts, he was a man with vision. It was the emergence of wildlife cinematography that allowed him to slow down the footage of the ruffed grouse and look at it frame by frame to figure out what was happening. Ah, so he brought a little movie magic to the situation. So what were, or I suppose, what are the wings hitting to make the sound? What he found was that the only thing the wings were striking was air. Air. And this is the cool part. They move their wings back and forth so fast that they actually create a vacuum, which creates many sonic booms. Hold on a second. You're telling me that this bird that is difficult to see in our forest is actually creating a sonic boom? I know, right? It is actually breaking the sound barrier. And blowing my mind. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I know nature is not in the business of just doing cool stuff to impress us. So why are they doing this? 
So I talked to Kathy Jones at Bird Studies Canada, and she told me that it's part of a display that the males do. They get up on a stage, a low log or a rock or a stump, and make the drumming sounds as a territorial display and to draw in and impress the ladies. And they'll use the same log for years, according to Kathy. The sound has a really low frequency, about 40 hertz, which means that while females and humans can hear it, it's too low for owl predators to hear. Of course they're doing it to impress the ladies. I feel like that's why animals do all cool things. Am I right? That They do a lot of things for that purpose, yes. <laughs> I guess we're all animals after all. When is the best time to hear the grouse doing this? According to the Rough Grouse Society, yes, that's a thing, they can and will drum any time of year as long as their log isn't buried in snow. But their displays are most frequent in the spring during breeding season. No surprise. As with a lot of birdie things, the best time to hear this is just before and after sunrise, although they can go on all day and into early evening, according to Cornell's All About Birds. And they'll sometimes even perform their drumming on moonlit nights. Sounds like they have a real romantic spirit. <laughs> so when you're out in the woods, keep an ear out for the woodland bird with the sonic boom. I definitely will. I have actually never noticed this sound before, so I'm going to be paying particular attention while I'm out on my walks this summer. Thanks, Leanne, for another peek into the wild world of nature. Bye. Bye, Michelle. One of the things I love about working at Cottage Life is researching and discovering new things. And even after a lifetime of cottaging, there's always something new to learn. Although some things I wish I could unlearn. For instance, did you know that mosquitoes can detect the carbon dioxide in your breath from 75 feet away? So, if it ever feels like they're following you, whether you're out for a hike or paddling across a lake, you're probably right. But off DEET-free mosquito repellent keeps them from biting, so you can enjoy your time outdoors. It works for up to five hours, it isn't greasy or oily like some other repellents, and it's safe for the whole family, six months and up. So this summer, maybe the mozzies will bug your neighbors with the blaring deck stereo instead of you. We've been closing the podcast with some of our favorite essays published in Cottage Life. This one ran in a special issue celebrating the 10th anniversary of the magazine in the summer of 1997. The Drive, written by Diane Forrest, is read by Sarah Martin. There are two kinds of people driving to the cottage. Bullet drivers, who designate an official launch time, catapult their vehicles onto the highway and do not stop for anything until they reach the lake. And those happy meanderers for whom the winsome, quote unquote, getting there is at least half the fun of cottaging. My parents were bullet drivers and no suffering, no danger to life or property could hold them back in their compulsion to do the 169 kilometer drive as fast as possible. I grew up in a family where the first order of business on arrival was not, have you seen the loons, or isn't that a gorgeous sunset, but how long did it take you? The family record is an hour and 20 minutes. I've done it in an hour and a half. Bullet drivers are scary. I was used to it, but my friends dragged up to Muskoka to visit me as a supposed treat remember cowering in the back seat, watching my father who has a bad habit of falling asleep while driving, as he leaned on the wheel, hands dangling loosely, eyes half closed, steering with his forearms, going about as fast as our car, a secondhand police cruiser, would go. Our Siamese cat never got used to it either, and was much less polite about the whole business. My parents tried various methods of subduing her, including a misguided episode with tranquilizers. Rather than knocking her out, these had the effect of about two martinis, so the cat was not just noisy, obnoxious, and liable to pounce, but stoned as well. A sort of feline Betty Davis staggering around the car, leaping on my father's neck, crawling under the brake pedal, and warning us all in a drunken caterwaul to buckle up. It was going to be a bumpy night. Then, of course, there was the antique dining table my grandmother gave us to take back to the city on Labor Day. 
It was on top of the car when we left the cottage. It was not there when we arrived home. Late into the night, Mom and Dad listened anxiously to the CFRB traffic report for news of a multi-car pileup caused by a flying Duncan Fife. My parents' attitude wasn't unusual. The drive is, quote, something to be confronted and beaten, unquote, says one driver I know, who cashed in his RRSPs at the dewy age of 18 to buy a car because he just couldn't stand the leisurely pace of the relatives he usually hitched a ride with. There are no charming back roads on the way to his cottage. Only one limitless two-lane highway with shoulders where slower drivers, if they know what's good for them, can take shelter while the road warriors pass. The kind of highway that slowly turns your mind to the dark side, obsessively plotting a nasty end for the obnoxious little white Toyota that's had its left blinker on for the last 20 kilometers. Sure, I keep track, this driver mutters. I remember who didn't let me in and who did. But he's not an aggressive driver, oh no. Except perhaps occasionally, when someone needs to be punished. Some bonehead who's pulled out when he shouldn't. He's trying to pass five cars, and you can see that transport truck coming over the crest of the hill, and now he wants back in, so I accelerate, just enough till I can sense the beads of sweat on his forehead. Then I'll slow down to let him in. Given my genes, it would seem inevitable that I would become a bullet driver. I've been known to drive the 400. I've even driven with what a friend of mine calls the Friday nightclub. This elite core of cottage drivers thundering through the dark, 140 kilometers an hour, three feet apart. Think of the U.S. tank division chasing the Iraqis out of Kuwait, only considerably more ruthless. I, however, was saved from my bellicose driving tendencies by my brother-in-law, the ultimate meanderer. His meandering starts even before he's on the road. If he says they're leaving Thursday morning, my sister knows ETD could be any time between Thursday noon and Saturday morning. In the days before I had a car, I often made the trip with him on Friday nights. I had to be on the street corner at 5 sharp. This is how I learned that standing on street corners can bring you unwanted attention. Sometime around 6, having stopped to play pool with a client or fix a friend's toilet, he'd be there. The trip up was different every time, as he searched for the best possible route. And if it happened in August, it also involved a hunt for the best possible corn. There's a guy a few miles on with better corn, he'd say confidently as we zoomed past a truckload pulled up at the gas station. Five minutes later, you know, I think that was the guy with the good corn. Don't you think so? Do you think we should turn around and go back? But even the ultimate meanderer knows the laws of cottaging do not allow you to backtrack once you're en route to the cottage. Does the space shuttle crew go back to the launch pad because somebody forgot his lunch? Two hours later, we reach the cottage. Having inspected unsatisfactory corn during multiple stops and finally settled for a bag of wizened ears because it was the only stand left. Meanwhile, whoever is at the cottage already bought the deliciously succulent corn that morning at the Dominion. They ate it all because we were so late, they thought we weren't coming. My theory is that the difference between bullet drivers and meanderers is a simple variation in interpretation of the laws of cottaging. Bullet drivers believe that they're not at the cottage until they're at the cottage. But I believe, thanks to the teachings of the ultimate meanderer, that as soon as I get in the car with a bag of trashy thrillers, the radio turned to the Jays game and a full intention of buying extreme barbecue potato chips at the store in Zephyr, I am ipso facto already at the cottage. Take food, for example. As you know, the laws of cottaging say that anything you eat while at the cottage doesn't count. Meanderers interpret this law to mean that anything you eat on the drive up, including the A for said extreme potato chips, doesn't count either. Witness my friend Carol, who grazes her way to the cottage. First, I have to stop just past Sunderland to get my cheese curds. I get very upset if they don't have them. Then a mile later, I stop at the Brock stop for a very substantial greasy spoon breakfast. That sustains me until I get to Fenelon Falls, where I get the deluxe Chelsea buns. Burnt River is the last stop for the Kawartha Dairy buttermilk, which is to die for. Carol eventually wanders in an hour later and several pounds heavier than the rest of the family. But my friend Jim, whose particular weaknesses have included the Whistle Dog and Butterscotch Sunday and the A&W in Aurelia, says being a bullet driver or a meanderer has more to do with stage of life than matters of interpretation. 
He and his wife, Pat, were wanderers in their courting days and are again now that the kids are grown up. In the intervening years, his children's sleep patterns were the main determinants of driving style. When you've got two screeching kids, you want to catch them when they nod off and then just burn it. Little nippers are not that interested in antique stores or cheese curds. A lot of meanderers insist that they're just as focused on getting there as bullet drivers. It may take them three and a half hours to do what, under good conditions, by direct route should only take two, but unlike those clones on the highway, they never get stuck in traffic. The whole point is to keep moving. So what if it actually takes you longer, if you'd tolerated a few slow-ups? You didn't actually stop, and you know there's got to be some kind of prize for that. Like 16th century European explorers looking for China, these drivers are compelled by the desire to find the ideal route. And of course, once they've found it, they know there must be a better one. And they're damned if someone else is going to discover it first. Eventually, this degenerates into the urge to make the most obscure route possible, no matter how slow or likely to result in the need to call a tow truck. You mean you took the highway, these types will say, with withering contempt? You should have turned off just before the abandoned gas station, gone past the old barn, turned left right before you run into the swamp, and taken the logging road north. It's fine unless there's been a really heavy rain. Then cut off just before town, turn left where the sign for the drive-in used to be, right at the big oak tree, left again, then right, and Bob's your uncle. Well, I have no Uncle Bob, and it's after listening to instructions like this that I've ended up in Lindsay on my way from Toronto to Muskoka, or taken an hour and a half to drive the 30 kilometers from Gravenhurst to Washago. Aren't those the same cows we saw half an hour ago? Yet eventually, simple life experience transforms even the most single-minded cottage driver into a meanderer. Another friend explains it like this. You're on Highway 35, following a tractor pulling the only remaining hay rack in Ontario. Finally, after 20 minutes of utter frustration, you see your opening and you go for it. The road lies open before you and you have your foot to the floor and you're doing about 160. And suddenly your co-vivant says to you, look at that cunning little bakery. And you know you have to stop or get divorced. And as you're haggling over the piece of bread, out of the corner of your eye, you see the hay rack crawling up the road. And you realize that most of life is nothing but following hay racks. That's what cures most bullet drivers. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive up to the cottage. The award-winning Cottage Life magazine has great tips and inspiration for cottage living. We have a special subscription deal for podcast listeners, including a bonus issue and a free gift. Go to cottagelife.com slash pod for details. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me, Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock. This podcast is funded in part by the Government of Canada.